Okay, good morning. I'm Kimberly Way. I'm the Director of Training for Michigan Works Association, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Thank you for joining us on this last Tuesday of April um, for our next installment of our Great Practice Showcase series. This webinar is highlighting how Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation, or DESE, has partnered with Stellantis, formerly FCA, to create career pathways through employer partnerships. Our presenters today are Brianna Brazell, who is an engagement strategy manager at DESC, and Jenny Beaker, who is a lean process improvement, a lean process improvement, that's her title at DESC. Um, she actually joined onto this project in June of 2019. So it's been quite a while in the making. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to those of you who have registered following the conclusion of the training. It will also be available on our website, so feel free to share. Um, also feel free to ask questions during the presentation via the chat box. We will be monitoring the chat box, so we will be able to ask our presenters those questions that you have. We also recommend viewing this webinar in speaker mode so you can see the presenters clearly. Also, please mute your microphones and keep yourself muted during the presentation. At the association, we continue to add to our event and training calendar. We actually have the conclusion of our Workforce Advocacy Month panel discussion this Friday at 11 a.m. It is free to register for, and the panel will be discussing the Michigan State budget. Also, please note that we are still accepting presentation proposals for our annual conference workshops. Um, the conference is in September, but those workshop proposals are due June 7th, and the link to submit a workshop proposal is on our website, michiganworks.org. And with that, I will turn it over to Brianna and Jenny. Great, thanks, Kim. And hi, everybody, welcome, good morning. Uh, so my name is Brianna Brazell, and I'm joined by Jenny Beaker, and together we uh, were responsible for designing and implementing um, basically all of the Detroit at Work services related to the new hires at the Stellantis, formerly known as FCA, facility in Detroit. Um, okay, so we'll dive on in. Um, so before we get started, who has heard of Stellantis? I guess we're in a virtual environment, so you can do a little show of hands or, you know, just think quietly to yourself, whatever works for you. Um, who has heard of Fiat Chrysler Automobiles? Okay, and what about uh, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, or Ram? So, the reason we go through this exercise is um, Stellantis has had a number of different names during their tenure in the Detroit community. Most recently, they went through a merger with the PSA group to create the entity Stellantis, um, which is now actually the fourth largest automaker in the world. Um, but they are still the same company, FCA or Chrysler, that we all uh, know and love and have have uh, been close to for, for a long time in Michigan. Okay, so today we are gonna talk about Stellantis, specifically their expansion project in Detroit um, and the ways that Detroit at Work and the city of Detroit partnered with them to employ Detroiters. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick overview of the project and then happy to go into more detail if anybody has questions about something specific. Um, and then what we want to spend the bulk of our time on today is talking about um, the best practices and the lessons that we learned for future employer partnerships by going through this exercise because um, it has been <laughs> very large scale um, and also very long term. We're now in our third year of partnership with, with Stellantis. Um, okay, so the... Yeah, I'm gonna go through the project first and kind of take you through a little bit of a um, timeline on what happened here. So our story begins back in 2018 with the initial negotiations between uh, the city of Detroit and at that time FCA. So FCA was planning an expansion and considering different locations to either build new or uh, expand on an existing site. And they ultimately decided to build in Detroit. 
Um, and we, of course, give a nod to our great mayor for uh, strongly encouraging them to consider our cities. <laughs> so um, anyway, so they decide to expand in Detroit, um, bringing with them 5,000 new jobs in the city. Um, and what that does in Detroit is it triggers something called the Community Benefits Ordinance. A Community Benefits Ordinance is uh, unique to Detroit, so I don't wanna spend too much time on it, but it essentially mandates that development projects of a certain size need to negotiate with both the city and with um, a committee of partly appointed, partly elected community members. Um, and they need to be approved by that committee um, and commit to certain investments in the city and, and typically the immediately surrounding community for whatever their, their project is. Um, we do this because it's really important to us to include local voices in any new developments in the city. Um, and like I mentioned, we're, we're fortunate because it's, it's mandated <laughs> in Detroit, um, but the principle still applies without the formal process. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about ways to engage the community in any uh, partnership or any project, but um, that was something that was really, really important to us as we went through this and um, something that was important to us. Um, and the last thing I'll say about the community benefits ordinance is that we all agreed during that process that one of the most critical pieces of the project was going to be um, giving Detroit residents priority for the job opportunities. And we'll go into this a little bit more in a, in a second, but um, the reason or the way that we decided to do that was through priority application windows. So we chose to do two based on FCA's uh, hiring timeline. And, uh, and we decided to set up the application in a way where Detroiters could essentially apply first and go through the same application as anybody else. Um, and again, I'll get into that in, in a little bit of detail in a bit. Okay. So uh, the other big thing that came out of the community benefits ordinance was, um, and, and you know, really anytime you're thinking about an employer partnership, there's always going to be um, some, some different goals for each of you. An employer obviously has the goal of reliable employees um, and any workforce agency, of course, has the goal of quality career opportunities for their customers. Um, and so for us, it was really critical to find where's the overlap here. Um, and so, you know, if they're looking for reliable employees, we're looking for Detroiters to get good jobs then at the end of the day, how can we make sure that Detroit residents are prepared to be high performing employees and get the jobs with this partner? Um, and so that became our shared North Star was you have 5,000 new jobs, you want good employees, we want good jobs for Detroiters. So between the two of us, we're gonna do everything we can to have Detroiters be aware of access and perform well through this application and hiring process. All right, so um, this may be a little hard to read and I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time here just going through what all we did because this has been uh, definitely a labor of love but also a pretty long uh, engagement. So I mentioned that there were 5,000 new jobs coming online as a result of this expansion um, and that the shared goal between us was to get as many Detroiters as possible um, who were qualified into those jobs. So if we travel back in time to the beginning of 2019, that, that shared objective was in place. And so Detroit at Work and at that time FCA came to the table together and we just started talking through how are we gonna make this happen? Um, and we, really, we spent a really long time uh, really digging into the details here. So we did a super deep dive of the entire hiring process from beginning to uh, end and end not being just hiring, but actually being multiple months on board with the company. Um, and we went through in particular, where do they typically see somebody fall out of the process? So, um, you know, with FCA, they had a online eligibility screen that they do. So like, do you meet the basic qualifications for this job? 
Then they had an online application. So that's more of the typical application you might see of, you know, what's your work history. Uh, then they had an online test um, where they assessed your mechanical aptitude and some of your behavioral fit for the company culture. Then if you passed all of those, you were invited to an in-person interview and a dexterity simulation, which were on site. Uh, if you pass both of those, then you would go through what were called contingencies. So um, drug screen, background check, physical, in their case, verifying your uh, high school equivalency, um, then you would get scheduled for orientation. And if you showed up and completed orientation, then you start. So it's a pretty lengthy process. Um, if any of you <laughs> saw any of our uh, job readiness events, it can take up to 18 months. Um, and so we spent a really long time on the front end, not just making sure we understood every detail of the process, but also making sure we understood where are people getting hung up so that we could solve for that ahead of time. Um, and so we developed um, the priority application window model that I mentioned to you. Um, partly because FCA was invested in prioritizing Detroiters, but they could not um, give Detroiters preference in the application process. Every single applicant has to be reviewed under the same criteria and they have a policy of the first in is the first person to get reviewed. So um, there's no way where if it was just an open application that a Detroit resident who was somewhere in the middle of the pool could get given any type of preference. Um, and it was really important to them to maintain the integrity of that process. And so that's the reason that the priority application window model was designed was so that we could um, put Detroiters first in line, understanding that they still had to perform to the exact same standard as anybody else applying. Uh, we decided to do the two windows, like I mentioned. So we did this, uh, six month planning process. We use the latter part of that, um, that six months to design what we came to call the job readiness process of so getting somebody ready to apply. Um, and so we spent the whole second quarter of 2019 designing a process for engaging Detroit residents, preparing them for the application and making sure they had access to any resource that they might want or need to go through that process. Um, so we do all of that legwork to bring us to June of 2019 when we launched what you'll hear us call wave one uh, of the job readiness process. So from June through August, we went out into the community. We ran large scale events. Um, it was really important to us to have geographical coverage. So every district we did at least uh, two, in most cases more than that, uh, large scale events. Um, so, you know, at churches, rec centers, other community locations. Um, and what we would do is when somebody would come in, we would do a basic eligibility screen. So making sure, are you actually eligible to apply for this job? And those criteria would be, uh, are you a resident of the city of Detroit? Do you have a high school diploma? And are, have you participated in this event? Um, and, and lastly, can you commit to a drug-free workplace? Um, then the event itself would do a full review of the application process all the way through. Um, these are the pre-screen questions you're gonna be asked. If you have any concerns about any of them, we're here to answer your questions and talk through uh, your situation. Um, and then we would also do a practice test um, so that everybody had um, some exposure to what it's like to do a pre-employment test. Um, and then if for anyone who took the test and didn't feel comfortable with their results, um, they could also sign up to go to tutoring where they could do, basically get more practice. Um, if, if they were having some concerns with the math portion, they could go to a basic math class. If they were having some concerns with the behavioral fit questions, then um, they could sign up for a different class. But the point was that we wanted to, in a shorter period of time, um, give them all the information that they would need and also access to the resources to do more prep if they felt like based on the information they got, they needed a little bit more. Um, so we did all that work. 
leading up to the priority application window, which opened in August of 2019. So the priority application window basically meant anybody who had completed that event was eligible to apply early. Um, and so they would receive a personalized link to the FCA application um, that they could complete. And they had uh, basically four weeks where they had priority. So the first two weeks of that window were dedicated to impact area residents. That is somebody who lived in the zip codes immediately surrounding the plants. And then the second two weeks was open to any resident of the city. And then after those four weeks, the intention was it's no longer exclusive to you. And we actually ended up extending that priority window, um, which we can, can talk about more if it's helpful. Okay, so that brings us to the end of 2019. We've done the first wave of Detroit Priority. We had basically six weeks of downtime. And so we used that time to do a midpoint review where uh, Jenny and I went out to all of our career centers. We had uh, meetings with every member of our team and a lot of our partners who had touched the process at all, just to get their feedback, to get their thoughts on what worked well, their thoughts on things that didn't work well, things they needed for it to go better, or things that they had come up with that they thought other folks should know about and could, could also start doing. We took all that, digested it, integrated it, made some changes to our process, and then geared up to the launch wave two in January of 2020. Um, so we started back with community events at the beginning of 2020. And then um, as you all know, we had to press pause in March. So we put a hold on all in-person events. We took a couple of weeks to uh, revise all of our materials to be online friendly. And we launched in April with all virtual uh, services. So you could complete the job readiness event virtually you could access tutoring virtually. Um, you could, we set up a call center um, and email and text line for people so that they could access our support team virtually. Um, and then the only things we set up in person were if they needed to use a computer to do any of that stuff, they could make an appointment and come in to one of our centers to do that. So we had, the second wave was, uh, quite a bit longer, um, partly because of the delays related to COVID and the priority application window for wave two opened again in June of 2020. And same structure as the time before, impact area got to go first, then um, all of Detroit. And in July, so while that, in, while that window was still open, we started interviewing from that first wave of applicants. There was a pretty big gap between when someone applied and when they could interview. Um, part of that was always planned and they were told about that from the beginning and part of it was COVID related. Um, so those folks started interviewing in July and then the, the wave two applicants basically interviewed immediately following them. Um, and interviews are actually still going. Um, they're no longer Detroit exclusive, so anybody who's applied from anywhere can, can interview, but um, interviews are still active right now, so it's been a pretty, uh, <laughs> it's been a pretty long ride. Um, so fast forward a little bit to the third quarter of 2020, so people are um, gearing up to get their offers. There's two things that happened here. One is uh, the Stellantis supplemental model kicked in. So what this means is um, in large part due to COVID, there was unprecedented need at all of the, I guess at that time it was still FCA facilities. Um, and so they reached out to our pool and invited them to start early at a different facility if they wanted. And so every single candidate who had gone through the application and interview process was given uh, basically two types of offer. They could either uh, do what was called deferring and wait until their full-time position in Detroit became available, or they could start early at a Detroit Metro facility as a supplemental employee. Um, and so that obviously came with some unexpected changes to how we were serving our customers. And so that involved quite a bit of uh, reshuffling and making sure that we were contacting people that they knew what was going on, that they understood their options and that they had um, the resources they needed to 
carry on with whichever decision they make. The second thing that happened at that time was we implemented our uh, post offer or retention services. So this is for somebody who has received their offer, making sure that they have access to reliable transportation, childcare, secure housing, um, any number of different things. So basically we have a team of navigators that is in place to just support somebody in getting all the other stuff in their life in order so that they're ready to go to work and aren't stressing about that stuff when they're at work. The other thing that this team does is support the people who didn't get their offer. So whether that's referring them to another opportunity or preparing them with the tools so that they can apply again and be more successful the next time, um, just making sure that they know they still have options and uh, connecting them to the resources that are applicable for them. And then uh, now, so we're in 2021, the application is open to the public. We're continuing to do outreach to Detroiters to encourage them to apply and provide them with all the same services, but there's no longer a Detroit uh, priority. Um, so in some ways, a lot of the work that we did is uh, complete and in some ways it is uh, ongoing. So I know that was a lot, but I wanted to frame up everything that we did over the past couple of years. So you have some anchors because we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about um, the things that we learned <laughs> so, and what we would do more of or do differently the next time around. Okay, so we spent a lot of time debriefing. Uh, as I mentioned, we did the midpoint review and we have since done some additional debriefing and we took away a few best practices and things that we learned. Um, and we'll go into each of them in detail, but they can all kind of be boiled into, boiled down to five major areas. Um, so the first being actually selecting your employer partner. Um, anyone in this world knows that there's always so much more to do than there are time and resources to do it. And so thinking about who you wanna partner with um, is really, really critical. And we will sometimes joke that it's sort of like dating and you have to know what your non-negotiables are and who's marriage material. Um, the next is making a plan. And um, we really can't emphasize this enough. <laughs> we learned, you know, we spent a lot of time planning and we learned that um, there were places where we could have even planned more. Um, and, you know, plan, but be, be flexible because things will change. And that was more true this past year than, than ever before. Uh, last is data management. So you'll hear us say, if you didn't measure it, it didn't happen. Um, you have to have a way of tracking stuff and, um, you know, ideally data being as accurate and timely as possible. And we'll go through uh, the things that we did and the things that we will do going forward. Um, and then communicating, not just internally, but across the partnership and then with any uh, relevant stakeholders. So people, people need to know what's going on. Otherwise, um, they'll make something up. <laughs> so, uh, and then lastly is partnerships and engagement. Um, something we really took away from this is you don't have to do everything by yourself and often you shouldn't. Um, and there are a lot of times where it makes sense to invite others to the table. Um, so we're gonna dive through each of these five. I'll take you through the first one and a half basically. And then I'm gonna hand it over to, to Jenny to carry us across the finish line. Okay, so we'll start with selecting your partner. Um, so I mentioned earlier, sometimes we talk about this like dating and knowing, um, you know, sort of what are your non-negotiables. So um, we do recognize that our partnership with with Stellantis was exceptional in a couple of uh, ways. So one is just scope and scale. It was a, a massive undertaking. Um, the other is that we had a mandated relationship. So there were times where we could just fall back on contractual agreements that we had made with each other. Um, however, as a result of the Stellantis project, we did find ourselves in a situation where we had the opportunity to partner with a number of other employers and in those cases, we did have to decide um, how are we gonna distribute our ever limited time and resources. Um, and so we went through a couple exercises 
you know, if we were in a traditional corporate environment, we might look at a SWOT analysis or a return on investment. And so we try to um, adapt those models to look at, um, you know, where does it make the most sense for us to invest, so to speak. Um, and so we started with the idea of what are your needs and what are your wants? So what are the things that are non-negotiable versus the things that are uh, nice to have? And so, um, you know, in Detroit, there's a couple that are really, really important to us. I'm using these as examples. It's not an exhaustive or even always uh, the case list, but I just wanted to paint the picture for you a little bit. So for us, um, those needs might be that this partner is agreeing to some level of priority for Detroit residents, um, that they are committed to a background friendly hiring process. Um, we're always gonna look at the wage. Um, you know, does it make sense to invest a ton of time and energy into a $10 an hour job versus a $17 an hour job? Um, and that's always gonna be balanced with the number of positions that they're offering. So, uh, you know, if it's three $17 an hour jobs versus 500 lower paying jobs with a clear career pathway, maybe it makes more sense. But um, those, are, those are two things that we always weigh very heavily. Some of the things that are nice to have. So uh, no formal education requirement. So for us, best case scenario, someone does not have to have completed high school in order to be eligible for a production position, for example. Um, however, we understand that a lot of our partners have uh, national or global hiring policies and those aren't always um, up for negotiation. And so in that case, maybe the, the question becomes how do we connect this person to, um, to a GED program while they're in this process? Um, another might be excluding marijuana from a drug screen. So now that it's legal in uh, Michigan, employers are weighing whether or not it makes sense to include it. We know and they know that a huge number of their candidates uh, fall out of the hiring process at the drug screen. Um, and so in some cases, it makes sense to exclude it. We also want to be mindful, again, for a national or global company, this is a Michigan policy, not something at the federal or global level. And so it may not be appropriate for them. And depending on the nature of the job, um, it may still be very important to them that there is no uh, substance use happening in their workforce. And another example that, that we like to bring up is partic participation in GDYT, which is um, our summer youth employment program. And so again, this is one where we feel strongly that if someone is a true partner of ours, they're at least um, engaged in that program. However, it's not the right fit for everyone. So that's not a reason why we would um, walk away from, from a partner. Okay, so, but the big takeaway here is we, we put time in on the front end to thinking about what are the things that are critical to us and are worth uh, saying no to a partnership for, and what are the things that we're willing to be flexible on, but they're, they're important and we need to have a uh, open and honest conversation about. Um, and so something that we've really taken away from this time, and please forgive the metaphors, but we gotta keep it light uh, in this world. So what we'll say to each other is, uh, sometimes you got to swipe left. So if you can't come to terms on the non-negotiables, the partnership's doomed to fail. You're better to you're better off knowing that from the beginning and investing your time and energy into a relationship where you're both going to be happy with the outcome. All right. So I know I mentioned this before. Um, we love to plan over here. <laughs> so. Um, the, so the quote over on the right where it says, good fortune is what happens when opportunity meets preparation. The reason that um, I wanted to highlight that is because for the Stellantis project, some of it was just really good timing and really good fortune. Um, and it was really important to us to make the most of that by investing a lot in the planning process. Um, and I, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, you also have to be a little flexible. None of us expected a lot of the things that happened in the past year. Um, and that doesn't mean you can just stick to the plan. Sometimes the plan has to change, but this was the general process that we, had to, that we followed for the Stellantis project. And 
um, we now have set up a structure where we follow this when we start our relationships with new employers. Um, so we start at the end, actually, we start with the targets and then we walk our way back. Um, and so for FCA Stellantis, that meant we both knew 5,000 new jobs were coming between the end of 2020 and early 2021. Um, and then we started walking our way back from there. So we said, if it's gonna be 5,000 new jobs, what are the steps, um, which we talked through earlier, so I won't go back into those. And then what we did is we said, okay, to get to 5,000, how many people need to advance from each step? And then we started to set some, some targets. Um, so I listed a couple of examples on here, but we, we set the goal of saying we want at least 5,000 Detroiters to interview. Um, we want at least 10,000 Detroiters to apply. Um, and we made our own internal assumptions about how many we would need to reach based on that. Um, but we had to set some, some anchor points along the way. So if we know our end goal, we're gonna set some anchors along the way that we can work toward. Um, so we started, start at the end, watch our way back. Um, and then the other piece that was really critical in our planning process was knowing, um, knowing the boundaries. So what I mean by boundaries are the, the constraints that you are operating within. So what are the things that you are not gonna be able to change and you need to solve for? Um, so the one I mentioned earlier was the Stellantis application process. We knew we couldn't change that process. So if our goal was to um, get as many Detroiters hired as possible, then the name of the game becomes supporting Detroiters in successfully navigating that process, not changing the process. Um, another boundary that was really salient for us was um, federal procurement guidelines. So anything that we were going to be uh, adding to, <laughs> to our resources needed to follow the federal procurement And so as we were thinking about our timeline, we needed to be very aware of the areas where it was gonna take some extra time to get something in place. So once you know where you're trying to get, you know the boundaries that you're operating within, what we did from there is built, uh, built our roadmap. So this is, uh, you know, what are each of the steps that we're gonna take to hit these milestones? And this, I, I think I mentioned making a few assumptions. This is where that really comes in. So if we are, um, starting to say, okay, I'm going two years in the future. I wanna be here. I know I wanna hit this milestone and this milestone. Now you have to fill everything in in between. Um, so the two biggest things we learned, you have to just use the best information that you have, make some assumptions and as things change, uh, adjust. The other thing we learned, um, was to build in time buffers because literally everything took twice as long as we thought it would take. Um, and I don't know if you all can relate, but some things just go a lot slower than you think they should or than you think that they will. Um, but that is something we, <laughs> we really took to heart the longer we uh, were in this project and the more we've built out plans uh, for other partners is double all your estimates, best case scenario, it happens faster and then you exceeded someone's expectations. <laughs> so um, and the last thing, and this is where I'll hand it over to Jenny because this is uh, really uh, close to, to the work that she did and she knows this better than anybody I know, but um, now that you have your roadmap, you know where you're gonna go. For us, it was all about uh, mapping out who's your team and what resources do you have to work with. Um, so I'll let Jenny do the deep dive here, and then I'll keep an eye on the chat in case anybody is um, asking questions about any of the things I just mentioned. Thanks, Bree. Um, so as Bree mentioned, we this was such a new undertaking for a project of this scale. Um, and one of the reasons that I joined, uh, like Bree had been on from the beginning, and I joined the team uh, to introduce lean principles for project management. So in the city of Detroit, we have a lean team that works on process improvements and introducing consistency and service delivery to residents. Um, so this was a great opportunity to apply those to a project of this scale. Um, so the rule of thumb I like to start off with in a project like this is like, 
who do you have to work with and who do you have to work with? Um, this can be both imposed partnerships. Uh, so there might be elements of other teams that you uh, you have to work with them, um, but you can also try to change that view to consider them as like, uh, what can they contribute? What can you use them for? So. Um, the best way to we, we approach this was first to sort of establish the framework like Bree mentioned we planned and planned and then take it two degrees further than you think you do you need to for for each element um, and identify roles and responsibilities for who's going to do what within that plan. Um, so in our case, uh, we assigned between Bree, myself and other uh, leadership who were gonna take the lead on certain elements, who would support them, how would there be like a structure of folks underneath them um, so that we would have like a point person, a backup person, and then everyone else would be informed. So if you haven't used RACIs before, um, this was a really good thing that we started to, to outline for those who are responsible for doing it, who's accountable for making sure that it gets done, other entities you're going to consult and others that you're going to inform. And we'll touch on um, consulting and informing a little bit later in communications. Um, this is a really iterative process because in our case, we had not undertaken a, a project of this scale and of this nature. So for, uh, you know, workforce development, we were suddenly tasked with holding uh, dozens, eventually hundreds, and eventually thousands of events um, throughout the city. So we had to figure out, it was a kind of a crash course of like, what does it take to put on these events? What does it take to manage something of, of this scale? Um, so we kind of had to find our footing there and people got new responsibilities. Um, but what we did here was work to see like, what makes sense? Is there something in, in someone's wheelhouse if they have enough expertise or experience doing that, that they can help us? Um, and the, the key point here is, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative effort. It takes the team. Uh, you cannot do this stuff alone and you should not expect to because you're, you're going to need help. Um, and we had some, some really funny anecdotes about, uh, you know, planning out events. And we had a, uh, an event one day we realized no one had ordered chairs for this event. So we had everything else ready to go, except nowhere for a hundred people to sit. Um, and this is when we were really, really lucky to have uh, other city departments to, to pitch in. Um, so we used our, um, our contacts at our general services division. They helped us to get chairs that morning um, so that we had places for people to sit. Uh, and then we worked out uh, another kind of checklist with them that if we needed to have an event in the future that we would know if we would need chairs and things like that. Um, additionally, we started to leverage our media services department because we knew that for any of these events, we would need to have certain resources. Sometimes audiovisual equipment was available, other times it wasn't because we were moving to different locations uh, multiple times per week. So the media services was good to work with us um, and we built up that trust and reliability that we could actually borrow some of their equipment until we uh, eventually were able to procure our own. Um, so this gave us some time to adjust with like identifying what needs we had that we wouldn't have anticipated before um, and then give us a little bit of flexibility to work through those growing pains as we, we assume these new roles and responsibilities. Um, we also had a tremendous amount of support from our Department of Neighborhoods who helped us in coordinating volunteers. Um, so they had an outreach into areas that we wouldn't have um, into community volunteers who were able to come and support with staffing at our event because we needed dozens of people uh, throughout the summer and we could not hire dozens more uh, full time employees. So that was great. Um, and as we worked through these, once we got this, uh, these roles, responsibilities, a better idea of how we needed to approach these events and the, the whole project with like a, a more documented process, we fell into a much better groove with that. So um, oops, we've got uh, more examples of this documented that we're happy to share um, because our, our whole thing here is like, let us learn from, from our experiences, learn from our mistakes and learn from our growth. We're happy to share any of these to, to help you if you, you can undertake something like this. So in terms of data management, I'm going to take a quick poll question here. If you can take a few seconds and type in the chat, 
Um, what kind of tools and systems are you using to keep track of uh, customer information, who your job seekers are, what your demographics look like? This can be anything from like maybe do you use Osmos data? Uh, do you use an Excel spreadsheet? Uh, what kind of tools and systems are you using to, to keep track of information? And so I'm seeing Salesforce, uh, uh, Access, Excel, and other files. So there's a whole range of things that you, you can use here. And Bree mentioned this earlier, it's really critical to identify what kind of data you're gonna need to collect. Because as we say, if you can't measure it and show how you got to that calculation, it might as well not have happened because uh, it, it, it's a little bit hearsay. So. Part of that planning aspect, and Bree talked about in the beginning, our calculations on what milestones did we need to hit and what were the data, like the measurable data points that we would know we were doing a good job. So with this, um, you need to know upfront what you're going to measure so that you can establish an approach for how you're going to measure it. Um, for us, we had uh, two critical reasons for measuring this data. Uh, we needed to stay on track. We needed to know that what we were doing was working. And we also needed to have that information in a shareable way with our partnerships so that we could both hold each other accountable. We needed to know what kind of information we were sharing with uh, FCA Stellantis, and we would need to know from what they were doing with it and reporting back to us that we were, we were giving them what they needed to reach our job seekers. So um, this helped to really hold both parties accountable. Um, and as you're looking at your data management system, um, considering what you want to track, and this is almost like the, uh, you know, your nice to haves and your absolute deal breakers is what level of information is critical for you to collect and what would be additionally nice to have. So for us, our absolute needs for data were uh, contact information. So like name, email, phone number. Um, some sort of indication of their residency uh, with preference to the zip code because we had this certain impact area that we needed to isolate from the rest of Detroit. But ultimately we needed to know that you lived in Detroit. And we also had to verify self-reported that you had a high school equivalent um, for the educational requirement. Uh, over time, we realized there were lots of other things we would like to know that would help us help our customers. So things like their employment status, do they have childcare needs? Do they have children? Um, do they have transportation needs? Um, but we realized that this is really a balancing act right there because the more information we, we wanted to collect the information because the more data we have, the more we could design solutions around it. But as you ask for this, it's also a deterrent for your customer to report this information to you. So we had started off in the beginning with a kind of general interest form that was really, really popular. We got, I think, in the first few weeks, about 40,000 people who expressed interest in, uh, in these job opportunities. But it wasn't in a way that we could, it wasn't enough information for us to work on, uh, to work with, to get them in our, um, our, our own information system. So then we tweaked that. We created a kind of an intake form and we're like, great, you know, we've got to get more information from 40,000 people. Well, then that dropped to about half. Um, and then we, as we introduced more questions to improve that quality of information, we saw less and less response to it because people just didn't want to take any more than five minutes or 10 minutes to go through and fill out a form. Um, so we worked best with what we could have and then again shortened that to make sure it would be easier for customers to give us the information that we absolutely needed for them to work with. Uh, also highlighting on here, the as you're collecting this information, making sure that it's private. In our case, because we were working uh, with a partner, we knew we would have to make referrals, but we wanted to be very, very sensitive to any private information we might be sharing with them. Um, so we do not collect social security numbers. We did um, look for zip codes and addresses and uh, residents were asked to bring some sort of proof of where they lived in Detroit, if that was a valid ID or some other indication like mail, we could track this information, but not where they, uh, you know, anything that might be legally jeopardizing for them. Um, we also did not share any information with Talantis besides their, um, their name, 
and their contact information, but not uh, at any way that that could be uh, more invasive for, for that customer. Um, something else that we learned as far as collecting this information is a way to check on it regularly. So once you've established what information you need to collect, how are you checking back to make sure that um, this is the, the information, this is, this is correct and what you need? Um, so what we started to see was we would have duplicates. Um, if there's one thing to emphasize here on taking away from a project of this scale is identifying a unique customer number to make sure that you're not double counting residents. Um, in our case, we needed to get, you know, 5,000, 10,000 people in certain stages. We needed them to be unique individuals. We couldn't double count them. Um, and we did unfortunately see some of that, but fortunately we saw it early enough that we could question it and correct our course and, uh, and, and take it from there. In our case, we were lucky that we were already underway to implement a data management system, a uh, customer relationship management actually, through a Salesforce product called Launchpad. Um, this was in many ways though, still a blessing and a curse because um, we were really early in our design stage for that. So we weren't quite ready to uh, you know, lock down some of the programming and the coding that we needed to. So this was kind of designing our information airplane while it's in flight. Um, so as we, we worked through those, we did find some solutions, but in hindsight, we would have done some things differently. Um, and part of that was, as I mentioned, with registrations and collecting information, understanding the human behaviors of our job seekers and how they might be sharing information with us. Um, so if uh, they were using uh, smartphones instead of computers most of the time. So we realized that we needed to make our uh, information collection a lot more user friendly to adapt it to phones and not reliance on, on um, tablets or other you know, home computers. Um, and we did use this information to segment them to a certain degree. As Bree mentioned, all of the steps that were required for us to qualify a candidate, we were able to do an intake process and highlight, okay, did you have four of these five requirements, but we're still waiting on proof of residency, then we could know that that person wasn't yet fully eligible, but hopefully we could reach out and remind them if they can just show us some proof of residency, we can get them fully qualified. Um, but ultimately, this really helped us to, to segment those and, um, and, and manage that information more effectively. So if you're not in a situation yet where you have a tool like uh, you know, Salesforce or uh, more sophisticated system design, there are a lot of other tools that you can use. We actually, on many occasions, went back to things like Google Forms uh, because it was just easier for our users to, to, to submit information. Um, we used MailChimp and uh, other text uh, outreach programs that were really good in using, like kind of combining the data that we had internally, but putting that in a way that it could reach our customers more effectively. Um, so uh, similar to like making your plan, have an idea, but then tweak that as you need um, to, make it, to make it work for you and more importantly, make it work for the job seekers that you're serving. Um, so if you have any questions about uh, especially the CRM system or anything that you're, you're considering undergoing, we're happy to talk about that because for us, it's been you know, multiple years now of tweaking the system to make it work for us. We've got a lot of power behind it. Um, and we're really lucky to have had the experience with uh, you know, the motivation of FCA Stellantis to push us in that direction. But we have uh, since adapted it and tweaked it for other employers. So we're really happy with the, the model that we've, we've kind of settled on. And similarly with communication, uh, another question for you all, how are you keeping in touch with your job seekers um, if you're promoting uh, large scale partnerships like this? If you've got a, a hot topic you wanna make sure that customers are aware of, how are you reaching out and engaging with them? I see text coming up, social media. Yep, email, text, social media, and postcards, calling. Yep. So a lot of you um, are, in the, I think you've already had the similar learning experience as us. You need to be uh, diverse in how you share information, both internally and externally. Um, 
so one of the things that we identified too, as far as like the project management of this partnership was identifying the stakeholders. So this is similar to those roles and responsibilities, but these are the, um, a lot of the inform and consulting relationships that you're, you're, that are gonna help you fill out that plan. Um, this was, as Bree mentioned, really high profile. We had engagement from uh, local leadership. We had to some extent state oversight because we were receiving um, you know, state and federal funding. Um, so we had a lot of different stakeholders that we needed to keep informed. And we found that the more information we could have ready and proactively prepared for them would help us to focus on, on their input and, and anything that we needed to do in the execution of things. Um, so what we were able to do uh, is compile our information from things that we were, like a, again, our launch pad system, the way that we were collecting information, we knew our milestones, we knew our project plan, and we knew our, our, our data progress towards that. We were able to put that in a way that we could share with those stakeholders more proactively. So if there were things that you know, could have been an email or a dashboard or report sharing, we tried to use those. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we had time for meetings, that just like a regular check-in meeting with a uh, high level leadership as we needed. That helped us to, to balance the amount of time we were spending on reporting versus what we were actually ne needing to do. Um, so we use these and establish these kind of standards of communication based on what the need was, who was going to do it, and what they needed to know. Um, and so having the, these templates and this approach really, really helped with that. As far as the public communication, um, this is like the information collection, also a, a bit of a balancing act because we needed to be mindful of the, the timing and the frequency of these communications. We didn't want to overwhelm people. We wanted to keep them engaged, but not tell them so much so often that they started to ignore the messages that were coming from us. So we found um, the frequency of contact would be larger scale promotions, um, reminders within one to two weeks, and then um, something maybe about 48 hours uh, if they had an event or activities that they needed to prepare for um, to, to, to prompt them then so they would actually get closer to the date and do it. We also uh, worked with some of our own internal behavioral consultants to understand what kind of messaging we needed to use for this. Um, we found that keeping it simple um, and to the point was much more effective. We sometimes had emails that we wanted to send out um, to make sure that a job seeker knew exactly what they needed to do, but we found that was too much information and they wouldn't read the email. They might read the headline and the first few lines, um, which then created more questions coming back to us. So we really worked to simplify our communications and make sure that they were consistent and easy for our job seekers to, to receive and understand. Um, we did also balance this between text, email, we used social media. Um, we also at some points had robocalls. I'm gonna show an example in a moment of some of our media campaigns that we did um, to show like to, to really illustrate to to job seekers the kind of energy that we wanted them to, to have for this initiative. Oops. So I'm going to take a moment and show a video here. This is Raven. She kind of became our uh, the, the face of the, the FCA job readiness. So here's Raven. What's going on, Detroit? It's Raven. Listen, I know what you're thinking. Is FCA still a thing? It definitely still is. And guess what? If you want to register for FCA to get first priority for the jobs that are going to be available, you can do it today. When I say today, I mean like right now. All you have to do is go to www.detroit.work.com. Click on the FCA job readiness banner. Once you click on it, you can go ahead and sign in. Watch all of the videos because all the information is very important. Once you complete that, when the portal opens up, you will be able to get that link so you can be first priority. Listen, Detroit, the jobs are available. We just need you guys to go ahead and go for it. We can't wait to work with you. And give me one moment. I just got to switch my uh, view back so it's correct. Okay. 
All right. So yeah, that was Raven. Um, and as a few of you have noted in the chat, she has all of the energy. We were, this was, you know, in terms of roles, responsibilities, and an asset that we had, Raven was absolutely that because she brought the energy and the message uh, in a way that our job seekers wanted to hear it. So we used her and uh, uh, lots of things like a video like this on social media. Um, so we were luckily, um, you know, prepared to, to pivot because we had this ongoing information campaign. We kept updating folks as things changed because inevitably they're always going to change. Um, but having this uh, consistent messaging and repeating the, the most important elements really helped us to, to keep job seekers aware of what was happening. Um, one other thing that we learned uh, as well, it was not only just with um, how you're getting information to your job seekers, but how they're getting information and questions back to you. Um, this is also where like that consistent and simple retainable messaging comes into play um, because we had a few points where we just, we were kind of caught off guard by uh, uh, messages coming from, from the public. One of them was in the beginning that uh, people were actually asking for uh, incentives. We had folks who were not associated with Detroit at work looking for, uh, you know, maybe 20 or $50 and they could tell somebody that you could get them on a list. And we had to get ahead of that and say, no, Detroit at work is the only way that you can, you can get through um, for uh, Detroit priority. Don't give anybody any money, only work with us because we're, we're the only way for this, for this early access. Uh, so that was helpful in, uh, in, in, in getting ahead of those waves. And then as we had to pivot because of the pandemic, um, people knew where to find us for information. We could put broadcasts out on social media um, and we could let them know uh, whatever good or bad was happening, that this is the latest information they needed to be working with. Um, we did also realize that we needed a way still for customers to come back to us with communication and questions that was on a scale we, we had not handled before. So we eventually we set up uh, after hours access. So we, we have a Detroit at work hotline that folks can call during the day. But if that's you know after hours and somebody's got a question, how are they going to let you know? Um, so we didn't want them to just have to go to the Facebook page and make a question or make a complaint. So we set up uh, an email that they could send for us. We tried to broadcast, you know, the easiest ways to contact us any, any way they had a question. Um, as we had to, to switch gears during the pandemic, especially when a lot of people were calling our Detroit at Work hotline for unemployment information, we were able to set up like a uh, more of a specialized call center for FCA questions. So if you were calling, instead of having to wait for a general operator who may not have the latest information, you had an option to speak directly with one of our FCA specialists and they could handle that on a more uh, individual level. Um, and even with that too, with text, a few folks have noticed how um, text is really effective to reach our job seekers. We allow them to text us back. So we started to review those messages. If we sent out a text, we could review their response. Or if we were sending them questions, they could respond in the way that was easiest for them, not have to call us and not have to, to sit down and write something. And give me a moment here. Um, so for community engagement, um, this was uh, because again, the, the, scape, the, the scope of this project, we relied on our community partners and it was really a, a tremendous blessing um, for us to have as much engagement from the community and the energy around a project like this um, because we all want the same thing. Um, so what was great about this was having these partners in the community who were there, they were closer to job seekers that would not have traditionally come through Detroit at work. Um, so we were really, really glad that we were able to partner with them um, because they were able to, to echo our message and, and broadcast it in ways that we would not have been able to otherwise. Uh, Bree mentioned with all of the events that we, we held across the city, these, we tried to make these in community locations instead of just our Detroit at work offices. We wanted to get out in places that places and spaces that people were familiar with. So we made a point to have at least two in-person community events per district. There are seven districts in Detroit. Um, so we worked with our Department of Neighborhoods to identify locations and, and close community partners where we could host those events. 
Um, this both gave them uh, an opportunity to get connected with other resources closer to them um, and for us to remove barriers because we wanted, if transportation was a problem, to remove that. We wanted it to be close to where people live and work so that they could, they could get to us and they could use our, our resources in the future. On a, the flip side of that, because this was so large scale and very, very visible, we had sometimes more interest than we could actually handle. Um, we want, we found that a lot of people wanted to kind of, uh, you know, uh, piggyback with us to to reach the community, but it wasn't always in a way that was going to make sense for the job seekers. So we had to be intentional in the way that we determined who should be at these events with us, what's going to be the most relevant for the job seekers, because we didn't want to waste anyone's time. We wanted to make sure we could keep this, uh, this information, uh, an eligibility session under an hour, um, but still get them as much other uh, helpful information as, as we could provide. So we focused on inviting partners who were going to make sense for sometimes this was um, other employer opportunities. So we had uh, jobs that were ready to hire that could come and uh, co-recruit with us. Um, but we did in some sort of situations find that not all jobs were gonna be recruiting from the same audience. So we, we worked with hospitality, um, some of the other ready to hire, similar manufacturing jobs and even training programs that were gonna be complementary to the job seekers that were coming because they were interested in FCA Stellantis. Um, we also worked with, again, our Department of Neighborhoods and Community Liaisons to bring in other uh, service benefits. So things like childcare, we worked with um, Hope Starts Here to address any childcare barriers. Uh, Project Clean Slate we have in Detroit works with records expungement. So even though FCA is a background friendly employer, um, not all are. So if you're looking for work, we wanted to you know, bring you in to learn about FCA, but show you how we can help you with record expungement um, if that's something you need. Also, again, enabling people to get uh, updated ID, whether that's a Detroit City ID or a current state of Michigan ID. And I'm sorry, this keeps changing my view here. So with the eventual outcomes we had uh, as our targets, uh, as we mentioned, we wanted to get 5,000 Detroiters engaged. We had more than a thousand events across the city. This included things from our community larger events and uh, daily, twice daily uh, Detroit at work office locations. So we had more than a thousand of these. We were able to qualify more than 16,000 Detroiters. Um, so this again ranged from events of hundreds of people to maybe just a handful who were in a Detroit at work location for that day. We had uh, anywhere from 10,000, we at least 10,000, probably as many as 12,000 plus, depending on how we look at the data coming from uh, what, what, what we think and what uh, Solantis has informed us of. Um, but we, we more than met that mark of our 10,000 applications. Um, we've had more than 5,000 interviews that have been completed and lately uh, 4,000 offers and growing. So as uh, Solantis gets back on up to speed in the manufacturing environment, we're continuing to work with them and their tier suppliers to make sure that we've got that workforce from Detroit ready to meet their needs. So uh, Bree, I'm gonna invite to come back now and just in conclusion, looking over um, the, the key messages that we had for partner selection, swipe left when you need to, <laughs> um, but really have an idea of what goals you want to meet with your, uh, with your employer partnerships. Planning, plan more than you need to, plan down to a level deeper than you think you need to and still build in a buffer there. Um, that will really help you as you get into data management um, because that will show you that you're either on track or off track, um, however you need to, to, to meet those goals. And then communicate like planning, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, and this really helps your community partners and the public to stay engaged with you as uh, you broadcast these messages and make sure that they're, um, they're, they're still in tune with you. And uh, so we put a little bit more here. We've gone through more than an hour of uh, a project that's been more than two years in the making and still continues. So we tried to keep this high level, but in part the, the most salient points for you. 
Uh, I see a question about getting a copy of the slides. Yes, we'll be sending those out. Um, but yeah, we, we put a few other uh, just teasers on here of things that we learned and would love to talk about more and happy to share our experiences so that, uh, that you can learn from our mistakes and learn from our learnings. And at this point, if there's any questions, we're happy to take those now. Hi, Jenny. Um, Melody wants to know if you're able, if they are able to get a copy of slides. Yes, we can send the slides. Sandy asked if you could um, back up to yeah. the previous slide, the one that shows the more available. There's also a question in the chat. Do you use a software to text candidates or do you actual cell phones to communicate with candidates? We, we actually do both. Um, so we, we do have the Vonage platform that we use and then we will use Marketing Cloud if we're doing a mass text. Um, the downside to using a software like that is that people can't respond. So it depends, and there's a character limit as well. So depending on the message and depending on the group size, we might send um, individual level text, but if we do something like that, we set up a separate line so we don't ever have an employee sending a text from their personal cell uh, if they're not comfortable doing that. Shannon, I see uh, where can you find more information about Launchpad and Salesforce? Um, I'm happy to speak with you with our uh, Launchpad uh, contacts that we have. I'm actually not sure offhand how that started off. I know we went through a procurement process to identify an information. Um, we had a, a whole uh, information system procurement process we went through to identify what would meet all of our needs. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to speak with you about how we use it, how we're looking to use it all of the different aspects that we we are currently managing in it. And then um, I think too, if there are any others who um, have, are currently using Salesforce, uh, whether it's certain modules or all modules, um, it, I think that's a, a great way for us to share our own experiences. Yeah, and if uh, we're happy to stay for questions, uh, and if not, I think we, we can always use a little bit of extra time in our day. Uh, if you like to, we can leave with a video that we were able to put together uh, called 10,000 Opportunities that showcase the entire, um, like the, from the, the, the idea of the plan, like the partnership with FCA, and then uh, there's some feedback from job seekers on how they engaged in the process. Um, so we can share that at the end and also a link if you want to follow that series. And Bree, did you have any closing comments? Um, I, I think we've said a lot. Obviously, Jenny and I are really passionate about this project because it uh, has been so much of our lives over the last couple of years. Um, but we really did learn a lot from doing this work and um, have seen the power of partnerships with employers um, when, when approached with a lot of intention and thought. So if you do think of more questions um, or you just want to chat with somebody about the moments when you want to tear your hair out, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. And thanks so much for your time. I know we're all very stretched for time these days, so we appreciate you being here. Like and yeah, Terry, I see your question. Uh, yeah, this was uh, my full-time job for the peak seasons. Um, and then Bree? Oh, uh, sort of. <laughs> so my full-time job is serving the uh, entire manufacturing community in Detroit, as well as the small business community in Detroit. 
um, this certainly overshadowed all of my other work, particularly at its peak. Um, but I had to split my time a little bit. Yeah, I think for for most of us who are involved in this, we we no longer had forty hour jobs. We had more than forty hour jobs, but at least forty of them were were occupied with FCA. Um, and I think Teresa asked if we approached FCA. Um, not exactly because they had an active community benefits ordinance in place with the city. So our partnership was, we had a little bit of a foundation laid for us. And so um, we started conversations with them through that process. I hope that answers your question. Great. Well, thank you all again for your time. Um, we're always here to help. Again, remembering our common goals and purpose. Uh, so we're happy to support you and your, your local endeavors to uh, support Michigan job seekers. Thanks everyone. Detroit, what's going on? It's Raven. Listen, I know you guys have heard so much about FCA. Guess what? Today, we're going to go over people who have received job offers. We're going to go over what that process looks like. We're going to also talk to you about some of our partners and what they did with Detroit at Work to get Detroiters ready for FCA. So if you're interested, come on, let's take a look. So today I'm joined by my colleague Jason Spann and we're going to take a look back at the process over the last year for getting Detroiters into the 5,000 jobs coming to the new FCA facility. The process started back in spring of 2019 when the mayor and the city council announced where the facility would be and how Detroiters would be the first in line for the jobs. The most important thing is we're getting a commitment for jobs for Detroiters. Uh, and what is contained in this agreement that FCA has signed today is something that's never been done before. Based on the level of incentives that FCA got from both the state and the city, uh, giving Detroiters priority uh, was the only way that that level of uh, incentives would happen. So it was critical, crucial to the deal. I think just the excitement of knowing that there is going to be opportunity and just to know that you are given special attention, I think has uh, changed the attitude. I was looking, but I was also displaced. Ah. So I was just at a point, you know, where do I go from here? I put this application in, it's a possibility. You know, like I said, I've been trying since I was 18 and I'm 52. And there was always no feedback, or I'm sorry, Ms. Carter, you know. This investment, uh, is so important that FCA is doing. It's something that says to this community, leadership cares and um, corporations can care. After the announcement was made, the next step was to get the word out into the community about how Detroiters could get on the list for FCA. Hey, it's your boy Bushman, and are you a Detroit resident who wants to work for Fiat Chrysler at their new Detroit facility? FCA is taking uh, job applications right now. How did the Department of Neighborhoods assist uh, Detroit at Work with this entire FCA process with getting the word out? We hit block clubs, we hit churches, we hit nonprofits, uh, flyering email campaigns to make sure uh, we had great turnouts at the job readiness events. I was actually in the car with um, a friend of mine. You were in the car? Yeah, and I heard on the radio, and I'm like, okay, I see it's hiring. Hmm. I thought about it, but it just kind of, and then I heard about it through 
my social work. Oh. I said, okay, that's twice. Yeah. The third time, um, it was back at the radio. That's something said, Rhonda, go ahead, give it a shot. There's nothing more empowering than for uh, government and community to work together for the facilitation of bringing people to a place of destiny and a place of forward mobility in their lives for them and their family and certainly the next generation. The first job readiness events were held in the middle of June 2019. Over the following two months, we held over 1,000 in-person events. Plus, online and paper options were available, either at our career centers or in locations throughout the community. At these events, Detroiters were guided through all the activities that needed to be completed for them to get on the list to be able to apply for these jobs with FCA. In running the FCA events, where there were thousands of people um, who came through those events and saw people who looked just like them, who had similar backgrounds, some had lots of experience, some had zero experience, they all shared an interest, a strong interest in working and working hard. People were excited. I mean, people were excited. People were ready to work. Um, people were ready to uh, for better uh, employment. So uh, each event, we had a couple hundred. Uh, Detroit at Work had a couple hundred folks at each event. And if you run an FCA job, let me hear you say, OK. It doesn't matter for so many of these jobs whether you have prior manufacturing experience, whether you've ever seen the inside of an auto plant, what matters is your drive. It wasn't a hard process. They were very thorough, helpful. This is what I've been wanting since I was 18. Wow. So it's either I had to make it work for me or quit and I wasn't into quitting. At the job readiness events, one of the sections was a math and mechanical reasoning test. Detroiters in general scored very well on this, but many still felt a little uncomfortable. After all, for many, it had been years since they had to do a math test. That's why we set up hundreds of workshops throughout Detroit covering math, mechanical reasoning, and interviewing skills. So we saw a lot of energy from Detroiters when they came in. They were really excited about the opportunity. Their mindset was ready to go to work. They just needed some help with preparation. So these sessions are four hour sessions and we show videos on how to apply for the FCA applications. It takes them step by step through the process. A lot of folks took advantage of the tutoring programs. We had nonprofits set up in different churches around the city and folks were checking in and brushing up on their skills. I mean, a lot of us haven't been in school for a while, so that was understandable. You know, this opportunity gave Detroiters a lot of hope to be able to help the family become financially stable, help that social mobility. Um, and so for a lot of them, it was, they were willing, eager, and ready to learn. started in July 2020 and in August we started to see the first Detroit residents offered jobs. At Detroit at Work we supported the interviewees by providing pre-recorded and live interview prep for candidates and worksheets focused on the types of questions they might hear. So the interview really included a face-to-face -face, um, interview where the candidate is sit, uh, sitting with two of our interviewers and it really goes over a background from the candidate's perspective of leadership teamwork, um, the dynamics of um, any time that they had like possibly a failure and a recovery. And we really look forward to those things because that's really gonna be displayed out on the assembly floor. We want you to come in for an interview. <laughs> we want you to come and get to the next portion of your dream. Mm -hmm. What was that moment even like for you? Um, if hitting the lottery, if this is what it felt like hitting the lottery, I hit the lottery, but it was in my personal life. I'm screaming and jumping and my instructor <laughs> comes out, Miss Carter, what's wrong? FCA just reached out to me and I'm doing everything to hold back tears because this has been a long time coming. So what did it feel like when you actually got that job offer, when they said, hey, we want to offer this to you? Oh my God. Um, I, it's hard to describe because I, I couldn't believe it. I thought I was being pranked. I, I, I screamed, I, I yelled, and I, I jumped. I just got the best news I can ever get in my life, that they invited me to join their wonderful team. I can't wait to show them what's, on, what's, what's here, that I know I can do this. 
FCA brought with them a number of suppliers, right? So that's the other backstory that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. There are 5,000 jobs with FCA. There are another 2,000, 3,000 jobs with their suppliers. What they've said is, well, goodness, if you've got a model that got 15,000 Detroiters ready and 5,000, 6,000 Detroiters to apply, we want that model. It builds the bridge that I was speaking of, the bridge that unites instead of divides. And it's important for us to have that bridge because this is a long-term commitment. This is unique. And this sets forth to me a very important model and a model that should be replicated throughout this city with every deal that comes. So we are coming to the end of a long and busy 18 months, working to help get Detroiters into the 5,000 jobs that FCA is bringing to Detroit. But if you're still looking for an opportunity, make sure you get in touch with us today. As you've heard, the FCA plant is also bringing other employers to Detroit. Plus, there are other opportunities in other industries too, like the new Amazon distribution center that was announced this month. Detroit at Work has thousands of opportunities available, as well as training opportunities that are free to those who qualify, and a wide range of supportive services. For thousands more opportunities for Detroiters, visit DetroitAtWork.com or call 313-962-WORK. That's 313-962-9675 today. Hey Detroit, if you've got a success story about your career, we'd love to hear about it. So call us at 313-962-WORK or email info at DetroitAtWork.com. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you on behalf of the association and everybody else who was present today to Jenny and to Brianna um, for sharing your knowledge and for being part of our great practice showcase. I hope everybody learned something and can walk away with something new or some new information or even um, having Jenny and Brianna as contacts. So if you do come across any questions that you think they can help you answer, um, they can be here to do it. So Happy Tuesday. Enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you soon.